Hi you guys, hi you guys. Welcome back, welcome back to my YouTube channel. It is Dana right here and I am back with another word from the Lord for you guys. Today is July 30th. It is 10.02 in the morning where I am. I do believe that the Lord wants me to um, upload this word on today. So hopefully everything will go good with YouTube and it will be released and uploaded today. Um, welcome back to everybody who is an OG <clears throat> and welcome, welcome for the first time to everybody who is new. I am once again Dana Ray and I am a prophetic voice and I am sent to let you guys know what the Lord is sharing with me and um, to share that with you guys. Um, I think the first thing that I want to address um, before I even get into the word is I, there are a lot of people who have followed me or been with me on this journey and you guys are realizing that you have attached yourself or been standing for the wrong person like that's not the person that God told you to stand for that's not the person that he has for you um, I want to encourage you that we are human we make mistakes sometimes we God brings us into prophecy or these videos or whatever or these people that he has to lead us at a time where we think we are healed and whole and that we can't be deceived and we really are not where we think we are that is how deception can come in you desire well you some of you may have a familiar spirit that hasn't been healed like with love and rejection and abandonment and abandonment and being hurt and just overall desiring companionship and love and that can cause you to receive and take words that are not yours Yours. Um, be encouraged. Let go of the person that you have realized that is not the person God has for you and know that if God has promised you marriage, if he has promised you a spouse, the person that he has for you is going to be 10 times better than the person that you were confused and standing for. Actually, you should sigh a sigh of relief that the person that you thought was yours is not okay because God always has somebody better he knew you would make the mistake he knew that you would attach yourself to the wrong person he knows your heart some of you are merely have merely been deceived because your own hearts are broken God knows that and he didn't send you here for you to be disappointed at your mistake. He's calling you to surrender and submit to him so that he can get you on the right track. You actually don't have a choice. Like you can either just give up this whole life of salvation because you were waiting on a spouse that means your heart wasn't with God in the first place. And what is the result of you giving up your life of salvation? eternity with the devil who wants to do that so you don't have a choice so you can stop grumbling and mumbling and being disappointed and angry in yourself now you can submit and surrender your your entire self your entire life your entire desires to god and start over okay be like okay lord i'm cutting all these voices off that I've been listening to, I don't really know what's real. I don't really know what I heard no more because I thought I heard you and that obviously was not you. Cut it all off and let God be like, okay, let's start from ground one. This is where you messed up. This is what we're not going to do again and allow him to rebuild you so that you can stand for the person that he has for you, so that you can be ready for the person that he has for you. I don't think that anyone is sent here by mistake. If you have been sent here, if you have errored, it is fine. We have all been there. We have all chosen the wrong person. We have all been in relationships with the wrong people. God has to start with you somewhere. And if he had had to start with you in a broken space, then that's what he desired to get your attention. So just know that if you have attached yourself to the wrong person, if you have been standing for the wrong person, let the person go and know that God loves you so much that he is going to bless you with somebody 10 times better. It's easy to let something go when you know and you know God and you know that he's going to give you something better. But if you don't know God, 
then you don't want to give up the thing that's not yours. Know God. You will know God before he sends you a spouse. You, you can either do this the easy way or the hard way. You will know God for real and you will have a true relationship with him before he sends you a spouse. So this can take six months, a couple weeks, or a few years. It's up to you. You decide how long your wait is because you decide how long it takes for you to really trust God. So be encouraged. All right, let's move forward. Let's move forward. So the title of this word is Rejoice. God's sons are alive. There is nothing too hard for God. Ladies, he's your neighbor. Rejoice. God's sons are alive. There is nothing too hard for God. Ladies, he's your neighbor. Okay? God's sons are alive. Like, I knew the Lord was going to have me release a word today, um, but I didn't know what, and I didn't know what it was, whether it was going to be coming from a dream, whether it was going to be coming from his word. And I, this morning, I started to study, and I've been reading the scripture over and over again, um, and he just kept hounding on it. And then I turned to something else that said, like, the same thing, but it wasn't the same scripture. And I'm like, Oh, okay. This is what you want to talk about today. Rejoice, you guys. The time is now. The sons of God are alive, okay? Some of them have been dead, okay? I don't want to say awake because some of them have been way more than sleeping. They have been dead, okay? And I am talking to the women of God right now. I am talking about God's sons, all right? There is emphasis right now on God's sons. The men of God have to get in their position and the time is now, okay? So this entire word is coming from scripture. God is doing something new with all this scripture that he's having me um, base these words on, but hey, let's go with it, y'all. Let's go with it because one thing that is always right and that's the word of God. All right, so I'm going to start at John 4. No, I'm not. I'm going to start at Luke 7 and 1 through 10. And the scripture that he's had me keep reading over and over for the past week or so is Luke 7 and 15. So I'm going to go ahead and read that first and then I'll go back and read everything else. So Luke 7 and 15 says, And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. So I released a word a few months ago. I think I was even, actually this was last year, um, about the men being silenced, about their voices being silenced, about the enemy um, using all of these attacks and using condemnation and fear and shame and just them being out of the will of God to keep them quiet when we need to hear their voices, okay? God is saying right now that he that was dead sat up and began to speak, okay? He And he delivered him into his mother. All right, so let's start at Luke 7 and 1. Now, when this, called, this is called the centurion's servant is healed. Now, when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion's servant was dear to him, was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent into him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was that he was worthy for whom he should do this. So that his friends were saying, hey, like this guy is worthy for you to do this miracle on him. Please come and help him. Like he's a good man. He's worthy for you to do this miracle for him. Um, and they were like, that he was worthy of whom he should do this, for he loveth our nation and he has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. And, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter, enter under my roof. 
Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word and my servant shall be healed. So as Jesus is on the way to this man's house to heal his servant, the man sends people to Jesus and it's like, I'm not even worthy of you coming to my house. I didn't even come to you because I didn't feel worthy of coming to you. So he's saying, just where you send a word. I know who you are, Jesus. Send a word, okay? And for... I'll say, see, wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. The, the man is saying, I have servants under me and I know how this works. When I, tell, when I tell somebody to go, they go. When I say come, they come. So you're Jesus. You're way higher than me. I know all you have to do is speak a word and my servant will be healed. I know you don't have to be here. You don't have to show up. All you have to do is speak and my servant will be healed. This is the, the level of the man's faith. This has the, been the level of your faith. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that follow him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. Jesus turned around and said, I have not found nobody who has this type of faith. The man is healed. He will be whole when you see him. You are the centurion, okay? Your prodigal is the servant. You have been petitioning Jesus on behalf. Some of you have had faith so far. You have been so far from this person, but your prayers and your belief of what God has said and your standing and your fasting and your literal faith in, the, in what God has said has caused this person to be made whole. Jesus didn't even have to go all the way. He spoke at the word of God. Your prodigal will be made whole. Okay. The next story, the widow's son is raised. And it came to pass the day, okay. They came to pass, I saw something on my computer, y'all. Don't worry about it. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him and much and much people. Now, when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, weep not. And he came and touched the buyer, which is the son, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, young man, I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. And there came fear on all. And they glorified God saying that a great prophet is risen up among us and that God hath visited his people. So now we have a widow whose only son has died. He's gone. In the story before, the man hadn't died yet. He was sick unto death. Jesus spoke and healed him. Now we have someone who has died. God now chooses to touch. Jesus chooses to touch the boy, speak to the boy, and he gets up from death. God is saying his sons are alive. Some of them were just sick unto death. And God came in the nick of time and they surrendered their hearts in the nick of time and they are now alive. God spoke. But some of us had some of them that were dead. And if you know, you know. God had to touch 
them. Either way, he has done it. They are alive. Whether he spoke it, they are alive. Or whether he touched and spoke it, they are alive. Rejoice. The sons of God are alive. Mm, Jesus. God says, weep not. Like, stop crying. <laughs> stop crying. All right. So now let's go into more scripture. John 4 and 46 through 54 is what we're going to talk about next. Once more, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When the man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. I'm crying because this man asked Jesus to come and heal his son. Jesus said, your son lives. His son was healed at the moment that Jesus spoke. Your, Jesus has been speaking to us about the healing, the restoration of our prodigals, of the people that we have been waiting for. And we have not been seeing what God has been saying and he said, at the moment that I said they were healed, they were healed. This man went and checked back, was like, wait a minute, when did he get better? They said yesterday. And he said, oh, that was the same time that Jesus said that he was healed. It's already done. If God said that that person is healed, if God said that the person is restored, if God said that the person is alive, it is done. Whether you see it or not, it happened when he said it. God says, go, go in peace, go in faith. Y'all, this is a good word. Okay, now, Lord, I didn't even know I was going to cry, but it's touching, like, it's touching because it's so important. These men of God being in position, coming back to the Lord, is so essential to our world, our nation, our children, our families, our cultures. Like, when the men of God get in place, there's going to be a drastic change in the world. And they are getting in place right now now okay they had to get back alive first and they had to get well first but god is saying the time is now when he spoke it it was done John 5 and 24 through 30. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. I know this is talking about when Jesus come back. I know that. But God has given me this word in another way this morning. The hour has come when those who have been dead to the voice of God, been dead to who God has called them to be is now. And they will hear the voice of God and they shall live. 
For as the father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the son to have life in himself and hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the father which hath sent me. Okay, the hour is now that those that have been dead are rising, okay? They are awake. And God is saying, as Jesus only does what his father tells him to do, who have sent him, these sons of God are not seeking their own will, but they are seeking the will of Jesus Christ who has sent them. The hour has come. I think that's actually part of the title. I think that's part of the title. We're about, we about to change something up. All right. So rejoice. God's sons are alive. Second part. There is nothing too hard for God. There is nothing too hard for God. The Lord had me flip this morning to the scripture, Jeremiah 32 and 27. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. There is there anything too hard for me. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? God is saying we are about to experience and see miracles that prove that there is nothing too hard for him. There is nothing. I don't care how dead it looks, how bad it looks, how over it seems. There is nothing too hard for God. Nothing. You are about to see it. There is nothing too hard for our God. Last part of the word. Ladies, he is your neighbor. Don't forget, he is your neighbor. Your spouse, your prodigal, who you are waiting for, yes, you love him, yes, he cute, yes, he fine, but first, do not forget your responsibility to him as a brother in Christ, as a neighbor in Christ before he becomes your spouse, okay? You have a responsibility to care for this man, to cover this man, to protect this man, to love this man as you love yourself. Because this is how we are supposed to treat our neighbors and people in the kingdom of God. So before they are your husband, before you are expecting all these things from them, first understand they are your neighbor. Okay? The scriptures. Mark, 20, Mark 12 and 31. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. There is no commandment greater than you loving people as yourself especially the person that God has had you stand for, that God has called to be your purpose partner in the earth, your wife, I mean, your husband or your wife, if you're a man listening to this, but I know mostly women are listening to this and God is really talking about the sons of God um, being waking up right now. All right, next scripture, Luke 10 and 25 through 37. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit in eternal life? And he said unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, thou hast answered right, this do and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, 
a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed him, leaving him half dead. Leaving the prodigal, leaving the sons of God half dead. And by chance, there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed them by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of them. Let's stop here. The prodigals, okay, have been wounded, okay, by the enemy, okay? And some of them is something, is there are things that have, they have brought on themselves because of their prodigal living, okay? Either way, they have been wounded. And there are people that are walking by who don't even see that they need this help. They don't even see that they are wounded, because some of them do not allow themselves, their vulnerabilities and whatever they're going through to be publicly, like they are keeping up the face of, what's, of what they want to portray because they don't want people to know what's really going on with them. And some people may even actually see what's going on in their lives and they're still ignoring and they're not helping them. They're walking by because they don't have the spirit of God. And also because they have not been called and appointed to help them. Only you as the wife have been called and appointed and anointed and chosen to help them. There's nobody else who's going to send them the scripture. There's nobody else who's gonna speak the word. There's nobody else. I don't care what it looks like. There's nobody else. There's no voice that sounds like yours. There's no voice that will have the effect on them as yours. Obey what the Lord is telling you to do. There's nobody else praying for them. There's nobody else standing in the gap for them. That's why God chose you. The Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. God is saying, have compassion on the person that he has told you to stand and pray for. I know it's been exhausting. I know you had compassion a year ago. I know you had compassion a month ago. They probably ignored you. Whatever, whatever. God is saying, have compassion. Bind up their wounds. Pour oil and wine. What God has put into you, or you are to share and cover them with. The word of God set him on his own beast, brought him to an end and took care of them. Give them a place, a place physically or a place mentally, emotionally where they can rest. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, some money, gave them to the host and said unto him, take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more, whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I'll repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was the neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do likewise. God is saying, remember, the person that he has had you standing and praying for is first your neighbor, is first your brother in Christ. You first have a responsibility to them as a friend, as a helper, as a covering, as a sister in Christ before you are their wife. Because some of you guys get so caught up in love that you forget the help part. You're so looking for them to give you something back, forgetting that first there's a sacrifice that you must make because of who God has called you to be in the life of this person. If they did not need you, 
God would not have called you to them. They need your help. They will not be able to give you what you are looking for until you give them your help. And if this is the person that God has prepared and chosen for you, you can trust God that your obedience to what he tells you to do will not end in disappointment. Your expectation will not be cut off. It's those of you who don't trust God, who don't know God, who don't believe in like what he's saying that have a problem with sacrificing first, which means you're not ready to be a wife. He has given you more than enough. He has given you the capacity to give and to sacrifice. And he's going to fill you up until that man is able to fill you up like he, God has told you that he would be able to. Right now, you have to be his neighbor. There are many, 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 many roles that we have to play in this relationship um, of marriage. There are many, many, many different areas where we're needed. We are women. We can multitask. We can do multiple things at one time and do them well because we are women, because we have the capacity that God has given us. We don't need, I don't need you to love me to be who God has called me to be. All I need is God's love. I don't need you to love me for me to love you. I don't need you to love me for me to respect you. Because my actions and what I do are because I am honoring God and I am obeying what he tells me to do. And as long as I am in right standing with him, I trust that the love that I need is going to come. But right now, I don't need that from you because God has given me everything I need to do this and be this right now. And those of you, like I said, who don't agree with this, who feel like why do women have to do everything, you are not ready to be a wife, and especially not a wife, to a man of God. Okay? So until you get yourself to the side somewhere and go get the healing that you need and all of that and know who you are in Christ and know who you are in you and you believe it, then you stay over there. Because those who are ready know what it takes. That's why we ain't been running around here chasing after no marriage because there is a sacrifice there's there things are going to change yes we want love but it it's going to take some stuff from us as well in order to fulfill this role god has not had us waiting preparing praying standing and fasting for something that does not have weight it's a weighty position. Rejoice, God's sons are alive. There is nothing too hard for God. Ladies, he is your neighbor. He is your friend first. He needs your help. He doesn't need your mouth. He needs your help. You have to be fully surrendered to God to navigate 
this union. You have to know what to say, when to say it, what not to say, how to move. Because these men are fragile. They're not always going to be fragile. But right now, handle them with care. And the only way that we're going to know how to do that is when it's from God teaching us how. I have been on my face. Lord, help me. Because I don't know what to say. And I don't know how to do this. I don't want to say anything to hurt anybody. Because I know my words are sharp. And even sometimes when I feel like I'm being nice, other people don't really, they don't think I'm being nice. And I'm like, well, doggone. <laughs> what you want me to say? You know what I'm saying? God has to bridle my tongue and help me. Like he has to help me every day because my mouth can get out of pocket. And I don't mean no cursing or nothing like that. I just have a sharp mouth. A lot of women have a sharp mouth. And men don't want to talk to us because of that. We don't understand what things we say and do that hurt them because they don't express it. Ask God how to move when you come into union with this person. Ask him. He will show you. He'll have you read some books, watch some podcasts because we think we know men. We have no idea. The time is now. The time is now. I will see you guys the next time God sends me back. I ain't got nothing else to say. Bye.